Good. Good. Not as crowded in room as I'd like as we normally have, but I'm glad to see everybody's at least on. Um, most of everybody that is normally here. Um, so we have two things to accomplish today. One, we're going to talk a little bit about contract to close basics. We had some questions come up over the last week. So we're going to dive back into some basics, contract to close stuff. Um, and we'll step through that. And then two, we have a special guest in the front end today from Citizens Bank, uh, Jay Cox is going to go over current market conditions and mortgages, as you can see on your screen. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Jay. Jay is with Citizens Bank. Oh, Jay, it's on you. Hey, how's everybody doing? Hello. Darren, I know you. Everybody else is a new face. So um, my name is Jay Cox, I'm with Citizens Bank. So thank you guys for, uh, for your time and attention. So I wanted to do something here. Updating uh, moves, by the way. I um, want to do something here that, that makes a little bit more sense instead of come out and loan dump. Um, you know, something that, that pertains to you and, and give you a little bit more tools that uh, maybe you can apply in the market. So uh, I'll get get started here. You guys hear him okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So a little bit about me. I, I'm new to Westmoreland County, Allegheny County but not new to the industry. I've uh, been doing this for 16 years, so purchase focus. Uh, I, I kind of don't remember how to spell refinance. So my, my target is, you know, helping you folks uh, with the loans where a lot of the branches are kind of bogged down with the refinances. Uh, I'm licensed in all 48 states. So if you have clients that are transferring in and out of the area, I can help them as well too, especially on a local level. So previous market, I've been consistently ranked in the top 10 uh, in the area uh, with, with Western PA. I think I'm three or four uh, for purchase loans. Um, we do VA loans. I'm a certified VA lender as well. Uh, one of the newer things that I picked up that I've been doing for a while, uh, but just picked it up recently was Citizens. It's a construction and renovation certified. Uh, I'll show you how that will kind of play into some of the things that, that I talk about here. Uh, Guidelines. Uh, I'm an encyclopedia guidelines for you. So please, if you have scenarios, even if it's not my loan, it's something you're going through on the seller side. And you're not sure, you know, what loan products will work with a property. Call me. I'm, I'm happy to help with that. And then I'm also a member of Citizens Bank's mentor and training staff. So I train new loan officers. Or, yeah, well, I can talk today. <laughs> new loan officers coming into uh, into the company. Um, so again, knowledge on the products, the process, and uh, make it a little bit easier for you guys. Uh, oops, wrong button. Sorry, again, my apologies, technology I'm not too good with. So some things that we're gonna cover, uh, current market conditions. Um, we all know it's been a crazy market, uh, rate change. So they, these are kind of the big topics. Um, how I can help you guys win, uh, pre-approvals, uh, seller contributions, that seems to be a very, very hot topic. Uh, people aren't sure what they can uh, what they can get with it and what loans. So that this will break that down for you and give you a very very clear answer. Uh, inspections seem to be another hot topic on sales contracts as well, with electing them or I should say waiving them. But certain loans have do do have requirements with it. And then just uh, some different loan products that we offer that are a little outside of, of the box, so conventional and FHA and VA. So first we'll get into market conditions. Crazy market, um, here's what we do now. So uh, spring market, more homes are coming on, fantastic. Uh, makes it a little bit easier. However, notice the slowdown a little bit. Uh, homes aren't quite selling as fast. Uh, as they were three months ago. So days on market a little bit longer. Prices are still elevated. Uh, buyers, uh, th this is something that I, I thought was really interesting. On average, are losing four to six offers before they're getting their own offer accepted. Um, still a large number of buyers out there compared to the inventory. So we all know that inventory is a problem, uh, not only here, but everywhere in the country. Um, you know, you're having to get a little bit more creative with your uh, with your offers to try and get them accepted. Um, interest rates, 
that, that's that's a big topic that everybody is talking about now. And um, you know, from from talking to buyers, they're they're getting scared. They're saying, "Well, I'm just going to hold off. I'm going to wait for the market to change, prices to go down." Um, so those are kind of the what we're dealing with. What I'm seeing a lot on my side from talking with buyers, getting uh, working with agents. Um, Let me get into, so rate change, um, th this has been big. It, everybody talks about rates now, everybody's afraid of rates, they're afraid of what's going to happen. Um, yeah, so uh, just a little bit with this, the uh, buying power, it's, it's come down a little bit, but not a lot. Uh, so you can see what $1,400 a month will get you um, purchase price wise on the far right, or I should say the loan amount. Um, so just kind of give you an idea of where things have moved and kind of what, what's happening with buyers and the qualifications. The, the good thing is we create the narrative. So we put out what the public is going to see, what they're going to hear. So if, if we're sitting out dooming and glooming, that's what we're going to get back and everybody's going to be sad and nobody's going to want to buy a house. But what I wanted to provide was a 50 year span of interest rates that you can see that we are still well below the average. We're still two points below it. Uh, homes are still affordable. So when I first started this, we were eight, seven, eight, nine, and those were still fantastic rates. They kind of kept going down, seeing sixes, fours. And so going into the fives, it, it's not the end of the world and homes still are affordable. We're just not as spoiled as, as what we used to be. But uh, again, we can still keep everything positive with, uh, with the market just by talking about it and you know, a little bit more knowledge behind it. So I wanted to do a, a couple things here. And, and this, is, this is some ways that I can help you learn. Um, multiple offers, the majority of everything, I think probably 95 or more percent of the, uh, the contracts that, that I'm getting have been multiple offer scenarios. So automatically, I'm talking with your buyers, hey, if, if you're looking at 200K, we need to qualify at 250. So I'm looking 10 to 20 percent over asking, setting them up for that multiple offer scenario that you guys are seeing out there. Uh, what I found, it gives people a lot of peace of mind. They, uh, they feel comfortable. They're not in that panic where if you're you know, out in an open house on Sunday and there's 30 people there and you have to put an offer in on the spot, they already talked to me. They know what their high figure is. They know what their low figure is. And then they can come in and say, you know what, I've got to have it. Let's go all in or let's pick another house. Um, you know, the, the, with the increase in rates. So one thing that citizens does allow, we also have higher elevated debt ratios. Um, so with the, with the increase in interest rates, we can still qualify the people at the same level that they were, uh, you know, where a lot of banks have been pretty conservative with the, with the market change. We've stayed status quo or we're, we're purchase focused. So we want to try to stay as competitive in the market as we possibly can. Uh, limited inventory. So th this has been something that I've been doing more and more, uh, renovation and construction loans. So People are missing out on houses. We, we're well aware of that. They might find something that eh, they might like the neighborhood. They, uh, they just don't like certain attributes of the home. Fantastic. Let's make it the home that they want. We can do additions. We can do um, you know, maintenance, kitchens, bathrooms, uh, garages. Uh, so the, the, the options are pretty much unlimited up to $3 million. So we got a lot of room to play with. Uh, Rising home prices, so I, I try to stress the importance of talking with you folks and listening to, uh, to you guys instead of somebody that has maybe bought and sold two homes over the past 40 years, and I'm sure that, that you guys are probably really tired of hearing that, well, my, my uncle sold a house, and he's coming with me, and so I, I try to tell people to stay away from that, listen to their agents, listen to the real estate professionals. Uh, it just makes for a better transaction all the way around. Uh, frustrated buyers. 
Uh, I, I'm sure when you guys are out, you're hearing them, they lost this house, they lost that house, you know, they don't want to go this high. So I, I, again, it's, it's that education piece. So the more you talk to them, the more comfortable they feel, whether it's we're in a buyer's market or a seller's market, they're going to understand how that market will affect them, how it's going to affect their bid. And then I put them back in your hands where they're feeling a lot more comfortable. They understand escalation clauses, um, how that's going to work, and ultimately makes your job a lot easier in reinforcing everything that you told them that they just don't want to listen to. And part of the biggest piece is applications. So th this is one thing that I, I, I get frustrated about hearing. Um, I, I do a lot of rescue loans. So people will go, they'll go online, they'll, get, they'll apply, they hand them a piece of paper, and then they send you guys out touring around on homes for, you know, seven, eight hours a day, six days a week calling you up you know, late at night, hey, I need to see this house first thing tomorrow morning, only to find out that they really don't qualify. So all the correct questions are asked. So credit, income, assets, uh, self-employed borrowers, I, I apologize to these guys up front. There is so much more that they have to go through uh, for the loan process uh, because of COVID. So they're taken through the correct steps. Tax returns are reviewed. I know their income coming into it. I have a calc tool that scans all of their tax returns and profit and loss. This way, when I hand you off, hand them over to you, you're good. You don't have to worry about it. Um, and that piece of paper, you, you don't have to worry about blowing your nose with it. You know, you can take it to the bank. Uh, and, and most importantly, we're a team. We work together. The, this isn't an individual sport. Uh, I'm here to help wherever I can. We, we try it. We all have the same goal. They want to get in the house. We want to sell it. The, the buyers, they, they, they want an easier process. So the more we work together, the more we educate them, the easier it is for them. And most likely, the more that they're going to win the bid with less offers. So, And your time is your money. So pre-approvals, uh, I talked a little bit about this. Um, so what exactly is a pre-approval? You know, it, it's somebody's ability to qualify for a loan. Um, you know, we, we try to go through the process. We try to be as, as accurate as we possibly can. Um, again, we, we understand that their money is important. Your time is important. Uh, you know, it shows that, shows the seller, shows the listing agent that, hey, they're qualified and they can purchase the home. Uh, the big piece, and, and I think a lot of people miss this, is pre-approval, it's your paycheck. So, so it, it might not have a, a cash dollar or a sign here on it, but at the end of the day, that's what you're using to get paid, keep your lights on, pay your bills, support your families. Um, so that's why it's so important not to just have something that's just generated online, um, you know, something from a company that you can't get a hold of them, you have no idea who they are. They have no idea what Pennsylvania lending laws are, what the transfer taxes are you know, per, per township, whether you're in the city, townships outside of the county, uh, property taxes are paid in advance instead of arrears. So those are some things to, to really consider when you're out with people, when you get those pre-approvals, you know, come back and come back to you. You know, are they really approved? Is this something that, Am I going to be able to spend the time on to show them five or six houses to go out, you know, spend the money, especially in gas. So your, your time is your money and that is respected. And I try to make sure that you guys, that, that it is worth your time and, you know, that your efforts will go to the closing table. Seller contribution limits. Uh, Give you guys a, a second here to look at this. Um, this is huge. The, this is very comprehensive. Um, I won't go into detail and explain everything, but this really breaks down what loans, um, how high can you go, and what scenarios uh, um, you can apply with it. The, the big one that I point out is VA. Anytime you have a VA lender that says you're capped at 4%, they are 100% wrong and you pick up the phone and you call me. So VA actually allows all customary closing costs. 
So in Pennsylvania, that's everything. The, the stipulation is that is uh, number three in there. I, I won't get into big detail with it, but it's your prepaids. So it's capped at 4% on your prepaids. Um, so if taxes and insurance are high on a property, the buyer just may have to pay the difference. But I'll be honest with you, thousands of loans that I've done, I have not had that happen once. It, it'll happen more in Ohio, New York, some of those other states where the, where the property taxes are much higher compared to where they are here in Pennsylvania. But um, so when you're writing your contracts, refer back to this. Uh, I, I'm constantly getting questions. Agents are calling, hey, what's, I didn't know that, that uh, conventional loans will do 6%. They will. You have to put at least 10% down. Um, VA, again, with the all customary closing costs, FHA, everybody knows is always capped at six. Um, however, the, the one sticking that, that most people don't realize is investment properties are limited to 2%. So keep that. Um, if anything, you can rip the packet apart, or, or in this case, I guess uh, I can email Doug and, and he can distribute and you guys can print this. Keep it in front of you. It, it's a great tool to have uh, to, uh, to come back to. Oops, wrong way. Property inspections. So uh, I'm constantly getting phone calls on what inspections are required for loans. This is, again, a very comprehensive breakdown of what's needed. Uh, conventional loans, no inspections required. Utilities, nice thing with citizens, we don't have to have utilities on unless the property comes back as a C4 condition on a home. So basically with the, with the utilities not on, it takes it to a C5, which we can't lend on. So that's the only stipulation under a conventional loan where the utilities will be required. Or if the appraiser says, hey, by the way, there's an issue, then we have an issue. FHA, um, constantly hearing that lenders require all kinds of crazy stuff with FHA. They're wrong, it may be an overlay, it's not required for FHA. The only time that it is, is if the, uh, the property has been vacant for at least 60 days or a well and septic. Those are the only areas, or if the appraiser notes something, or if it's on the sales contract. VA, mandatory, well and pest, you can't get away from it regardless of what your offers might say, even if they're waiving it. Doesn't matter, VA will make you come back and will make you uh, do those tests. Um, it, it follows the same way. Utilities need to be turned on. And if the property is vacant for more than 60 days, you're going to need to do well in septic. And then, of course, if the appraiser notes an issue. So, um, again, this is something that you can, uh, that you can keep, keep by your side when you're writing your contracts. It'll help, help explain everything, even if, you're, uh, even if your buyers have some questions as well, too. Different, uh, different loan products that we offer. So, so first and foremost, um, I, I'm sure you guys probably have gotten phone calls after people have closed on their loans. Hey, I got this letter in the mail. Uh, I don't know who this person is. And it's telling me I have to now pay them. So nice thing is, hey, guess what? We service all of our loans, whether it's VA, whether it's construction, conventional, FHA, it all stays with us. Um, we put it, we even put it on our uh, loan estimates. There's a little box down at the bottom that says we, we intend to service your loans. Your clients can have a little peace of mind there that it's not going to get bounced around. You're not going to have the headaches. They can still call me if they have questions. If it's something that I can't figure out, I can then forward them over to customer service. Um, so renovation, you know, we can go up to 90% of the improved value fully up to $3 million, uh, no PMI, and we also allow it on second homes, our DHM or destination home mortgage. Uh, so it's our internal exclusive 3% down, no PMI, uh, better than market interest rate, um, and nice piece is it's underwritten to conventional property standards. So again, staying away from the government side might help, uh, might help your buyers get something over a government loan. First time buyer grants up to 3,000, Again, VA loans, 
uh, condos. We do condo financing, conventional FHA and VA financing available, uh, doctor loans up to 95% with no PMI and allow us deferred student loans, investment properties up to four units, uh, multi, multi-unit primary residence up to four units for conventional FHA and VA financing. Um, it, this has been the, the lock and shop program has been something I've been using a lot because rates are going up daily. So it gives people 30 days to find a house, get a contract, and then 60 days to close it. Okay. Still have many more. So I'm happy to bring any scenario that you have. I'm happy to discuss it. We'll make it happen. So uh, thank you guys for your time and attention. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, open up to some questions if you guys have anything. Um, please feel free. The renovation and construction loan you talked about, mm -hmm. it, is that the Carl loan or is that product something specific to citizens? Yeah, we, we have our own internal, um, port, or we call it portfolio construction product. So it's a minimum of 10% down, but um, we can do custom draw schedules. We can do uh, manufactured homes, not double wides, but uh, modular homes as well too. Uh, work with the builders to um, make it a little bit more flexible for them. And what is the requirement um, as far as the the builders or the the construction company? Um, do they front the first twenty percent, or the Citizens Bank front so we, we will, first? We will release funds um, at settlement. So it depends on what's needed. Typically, we'll, we'll at least do 10%, but we've had exceptions up to 20%. Um, so again, it just depends on the type of project, whether it's a new construction or if it's a renovation. So a lot of the renovations is material heavy. So kitchens, countertops need to be paid for in advance. So I, I just closed a, a refinance that they needed you know, 13K for cabinets and another six or seven for, uh, for countertops. And that was the first thing they had to order. So we, we went in and made the exceptions to it. So you guys do front that money. It's not up, it's not on the, um, the renovator to front that first. Yeah, so the, there's probably still going to have to contribute a little bit. Um, so your, your, you know, handyman, uh, might not be the uh, the best one to do the to do the renovation. Typically, it's somebody that has you know business lines of credit or a little bit larger established business. That this is kind of more their focus than than somebody that's hey this is my side job that that I do on the weekend. But yeah, we will front funds because obviously <laughs> they want to uh, they need money to get everything started. Yeah. Any other questions? I'm good. Okay, I think we're all good over here. All right, well, thank you very much. I, I appreciate your time and attention and uh, hope you guys have a great day. You okay. too, thank you. No problem. Thank you. Um, he left some folders here in the office in Pittsburgh. I'll grab a couple, bring them back through to um, uh, Altoona and Johnstown as well. So um, when you're in, if you stop in, you'll see the citizens folder on the on the table here in the conference room. Any any questions at all before before Jay dips out? Anybody have anything that's yeah? Uh, any any scenarios? Any scenarios? Any situations that they've run into recently, or anything anything at all? Jump in. Now's the time. My parents are looking to buy in the second home in Virginia and turning it into an Airbnb. Uh, possibly, and then later making it a retirement home. Um, I'm not sure if that would qualify as like commercial or because so they're it, buying it to be business. Um, or... Yeah, we, we really wouldn't even mention the Airbnb side. We just run it as a second home. Whatever they do after the fact, don't care. Yeah, but gotcha. um, okay. but yeah, to, typically when somebody's doing something like that, we, we'll run it through that way, un, unless it is something specifically 
whether it's like a multi-unit or, or something like that. Um, but usually we don't have any issues uh, with the, the second homes. Okay. Anyone else? I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Nope. No one else? I, uh, what, go ahead. Oh, no, I said I was about to say I don't, I don't believe so. Okay. <laughs> Do you have any questions on solar assist? I know you had something new this morning. Did you have anything that wasn't clear? No, I see that. Okay. Jeff, thank you, man. Hey, thank you. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Yeah. Yep. Um, as the market changes and things get, you know, whatever they get between now and August, if we get situated at a new facility. Um, we'll have Jay back in. If that's okay with Jay. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, try to have more of a more of a presence next time. Normally we have a pretty good stuff okay. room, but um, it is buyer season, so I assume everybody's <laughs> out. Everybody should be out showing houses, right? Absolutely. Right. Thanks, Jay. Yeah. Yep. Take care, Thanks. guys. Thank you again. Yep. Okay, uh, I'm going to shift gears real quick. Uh, coming down the back stretch of our the last part of our hour together, um, cover some basics of, of things that we went over in previous classes just to kind of re reinforce some uh, contract to close compliance. Um, Jennifer put together a great slideshow. I started to put one together myself and just found I was trying to reinvent the wheel. So if it's not broke, don't try to fix it kind of a situation. So um, my thanks to Jennifer for, for this. She gets all the credit for putting this together. Um, it's just as, as basic as you can get as far as explaining what to look for. Um, required documents. Uh, I actually tried to go back and rewatch mm -hmm. the video, but I couldn't find it. Couldn't find it? Yeah, like I'm subscribed to YouTube. YouTube, okay. Yeah, this will be a lot more abbreviated. So if you want to recap, a full recap, um, it is there. We'll, 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 I'll dig into it later, make sure. <clears throat> but it is on the YouTube channel. So if you have yet to subscribe to our YouTube channel, do so. Um, and we'll, you'll find all these classes um, available there recorded. Um, in the evening session this evening, if you want to join us, um, we'll probably dive into bits and pieces of this a little bit more in depth. Um, and uh, we're going to go over some block scheduling things as well. Reminder that next Wednesday, Joe will be here to host a um, workshop on block scheduling, and I'm looking forward to that myself, personally. Um, so keep that one on your calendar. Next week, um, we'll have PC as, as usual, and uh, I'm hoping to line up a showing or a showing field trip for later in May, maybe 1st of June, where we can maybe go out, coordinate a trip and go out and we can find a good vacant that one of our agents has listed and do do some showing practice and role play on that. So for today, I wanted to just touch on, we're at the end of the month. We're in a rush to get transmittal done and get our month closed out. And we have a tendency to run into compliance situations. So I figured it would be a good time to just touch back up on that. Um, in your command file, if you're accessing command, and if you're not, Stick around after this so that you, we can get command training going for you or reach out to me and let's set up a one-on-one -on -one and do nothing but discuss how you can take advantage of what command offers you as far as keeping track of your file, keeping up with your clients on command. In command on the left-hand side of the screen under your opportunities, you'll have consultation. In the consultation file, you need to have a consumer notice, a buyer's agency contract, and a proof of funds or pre-qualification. You don't have those, those three things, your file is not compliant, and it will not get processed. So we need to make sure that those items are in there. You do this right out of the gate. As soon as you get that signature, drag and drop it into command right out of the gate, and it's done. Under contract, Second tab down, agreement of sale, 
hand or earnest money, the deposit, estimated closing costs or net sheet, seller property disclosure, oil gas mineral rights uh, addendum and disclosure is there. Also, if lead-based paint is applicable. Those things are not in there, you won't be compliant, will not get processed. Again, agreement of sale, a copy of the deposit check, estimated closing costs signed by both you and the, the buyer, seller's property disclosure, and all other disclosures that are pertinent to that property, that are attached to that property. Signed by the seller. Lead-based paint, for instance, I know is signed by both. So make sure you're signing it as well. And then close. Once you close a deal, you have your Alta closing, dis closing statement or closing disclosure HUD form. Copy of that. And a copy of the settlement check or the commission check. Make sure that that is copied and uploaded into command under that third tab for closed file. Any questions on those three? Those three sections. Consultation under contract and closed. No, no questions for me. No questions? Okay. Some common mistakes. We're creating incomplete files or non-compliance. What we have, incomplete folders, failing to submit command folders for review. When you upload those documents, on the right-hand side in the big, the bigger blue rectangular icon, submit to MC. If you fail to submit to MC, the file is not compliant. And you can do that as you go, or you can wait until you turn your file, your commission check in, and you're, you've closed. You can do one section at a time or as you go through the transaction, or you can wait until you close. Failing to completely fill out the document, run into that a few times where we don't have a signature, we don't have initials on every page. We got to make sure we're getting an initial on every page of that sales contract, every page of that buyer's contract. At the bottom, every page initial. Make sure your signature is on the buyer's contract. Make sure you're following the steps of filling out the paperwork that we've laid out before here. That again, you can go on to PAR, parealtors.org, look up the contract or the, the, the form that you would like to learn more about. And it has a guide that'll walk you through how to fill out the form or how to use it or when to use it. So there's some good information, again, parealtors.org for the fundamental breakdown or fundamental steps of each form if you want to learn it. If there's a specific form or forms that you would like to discuss, or maybe we should discuss here, mention, bring it up. Let me know. If you guys want to go over contracts again, we can go over contracts again. If you want to go over disclosures, we can go over disclosures. Whatever you guys are uncomfortable with at this stage of the game, let's make sure we're touching on them. You can email me or text me. We'd be happy to either do it one-on-one, -on -one, or if we get enough response for the same form or forms, We'll just do a class on it, okay? Not using the proper legal name. What name is shown on your client's ID? Government issued identification. That's their legal name. What name is going to be on their loan? Because that has to be legal. We want those signatures and names to match. We don't want any discrepancies. Incomplete or incorrect addresses. It's not fully executed, as we previously mentioned. Incorrect or unreasonable closing or contingency dates. If you have a question on timeframes or dates, let's talk about it. Does anybody have questions on dates and conting contingency dates, deadlines? Since a lot of what we do is about dates. Any questions? I do. Um, yeah, yes, that's the initial. So Stacy just asked, um, right out of the gate, there was one that's 45 days, right? 45 days, what's typically 45 days? What takes 45 days? Anyone? 
to get to close? The closing. Typically, yes. Yeah, typically you're looking at a 45 day from the time that you issue um, that, if you're writing that contract, you wanna do 45 days or look at your calendar. And if a holiday falls in there in, in, that, in that time period, add a day or two. Um, if, it falls, if, it, if it falls on a weekend, add two days. Give yourself, give yourself some extra room to breathe on it. And remember, just because you're filling out the offer doesn't mean it's gonna be executed that day. So make sure you're making up for that day. We always have those ones, they happen, and they're gonna start happening more frequently as the market starts to slow. Um, it's with regards to the seller's end and the multiple bid practice is starting to, to plateau a little bit. So we're gonna start to see it slow a little bit where you're not gonna see that executed contract right away. It might take another day. You might not get an answer right away. Agent might, you know, the, the listing agent might not be communicating or whatever, but the intent is there. They make a commitment to buy. Somehow, some way we made the contract, but it's, two, it's another day or two out from when you made the offer. So make sure you're sticking to your 45 days, but look at your calendar and make it meaningful with regards to what falls in that time frame. Memorial Day is on a Monday. So be cognizant of that. If you're writing a contract in the next couple of weeks, Friday, and Monday, Friday and Monday, you might as well cut, count a four day weekend. Give yourself a day on each end of that weekend to add your 45 days. It, it's better to be safe than sorry or save yourself time to have to rewrite it. So 45 days ish, heavy on the ish, either side. Any questions on that? All right, there, really was a, there was another question somebody started had before that. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So I have um, like or my, I put in my buyer's reply to inspection. What I feel like it's been forever, you know, since I've heard from the agent on what she's doing. Um, like how long should I give her until, you know, I'm like, what is going on? Lorna, you know, they only they're doing their five days. Yeah. What would you say, Allie? It cut out. Lorna, she only has five days. So wh whatever your, how long was your inspection contingency period? I would have to go back and look, but like she told me that they're doing their due diligence on trying to price um, the removal. But ever since then, I have not heard from her and that's, it's been about a week. Yeah, no, no, okay, so. A considerable seller's reply. Yeah, so your, let's just say your inspection contingency was 12 days. I'm gonna, in the in the agreement of sale, it says 10 is the standard. I know I did it with you and I usually do a 12 or 15 day yeah. right now just because everyone's busy. So let's say we did a 12 day. Your inspection reports and your buyer's reply to inspection was due by that 12th day before midnight. If you got it in early, that does not move up your timeline. So if you got okay. your reply in on day seven, in reality, she still had day eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, plus her five days. Okay. So that, once you get to your 12th day, then there's five days for negotiating and the seller's reply to inspection is due that fifth day before midnight. Then you get two more additional days for either party to accept the terms or to not. Um, so you really need to go back and see what your, you know, when you started. Um, this is why I'm not calling you on, but one, Megan Link in Keystone is amazing because they put all this in your calendar for you. And two, you know, sending those emails, here are our initial timelines to make sure everyone is on the same page. Um, you know, find out when your inspections were due, when you got that in, and, you know, when the seller's reply to inspection is due. That is going to be five days from when your inspection timeline was due. Because you've had that for a while. You asked her, you know, your buyer's reply to inspection a while ago. 
You're sitting on, I think, eight days, right, Lorna? We cut out. Yeah, eight days. I really got. I think you were heading into the weekend. Yeah, I think you were heading into the weekend prior. No idea what. I think you were heading into the weekend prior to this, but didn't have the actual um, inspection or, or arrangement made till the following day. And so, and, and what uh, Ali is saying is is is, is, is basically spelling out. We've got to make sure if we're not hitting those dates, we got to make sure we're holding that other agent accountable. Um, right. if I, didn't, I didn't take the effect of the fact that I turned in early to her. I, I didn't think about that. What's that? I didn't think about the fact that I turned it in early to her. So to yeah. me, I'm like, as soon as we got it, like we already had a plan set of what it was going to be. So I did it immediately and sent it over to her as soon as I got inspection back. So I didn't think about the fact that I did my, my part early. I still think you you want to stay on top of it. You don't want to necessarily want to want to um, overdo it, but you don't want to let your foot off the gas. I mean, um, it's been right. a week since you've heard from her. Yeah. I'm out. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, let's connect. Let's 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 connect later on about that because I want to make sure that we're getting. You know, she, we're not. They're not dragging their feet if they already have a price for getting that removed and they can't afford it and they're just sitting and hoping something. I mean, we just, we have to get an answer on something from them. Yeah, it's actually been longer than a week. Uh, April 22nd, last time I talked to her, so. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, let's um, maybe get, when's the last time you reached out to her? Um, I reached out to her one last week along with the lender. I've reached out to her several times and it's just like I don't know if this is a normal thing where it just kind of comes to a halt on mine until everybody else does theirs but I feel like the company I should be doing right now and I can't get like a response to appraisal I can't get you know okay um let's start with the agent and get the uh reply to inspections finalized um without that none of, nothing else really Nothing else is going to move. Um, so your priority right. would be let's make sure we get that agent responding, at least giving you some, you know, the time of day would be nice. Um, so you want to make sure you stay on top of it, okay? I would shoot, I would go ahead and shoot her another email um, here right now. I'm um, just following up. I want to see okay. where we're at with regards to the reply to inspections um, and if we're still on. Okay. If you're still on pace to close on time, your next communication can be with the lender to find out what's going on there. Okay? Okay. All right. Sounds good. Any changes to the contract, make sure you write up an addendum. Let's not forget addendums are important to what we're trying to do. Um, you know, anytime that there's a change to the closing date, a change, you could... Reply to inspections if, if the buyers or the listing agent knows that they're going to have a hard time getting um, getting the reply to inspections done. Getting the reply to inspections done on time within the five day window, they would then put out an addendum, you know, looking to extend it. They're waiting on the pricing for something like this case here at Warner. So. You know, both sides of the deal have to be aware of any changes to dates, any changes to pricing, uh, any changes, any stipulation. Make sure we're, we're staying on top of that, okay? Specific forms, as we've gone over before, the consumer notice, sign and date. Make sure you're signing and dating in addition to your client, not just your client. Same thing with the buyer's uh, agency agreement. Make sure you got you guys are signing your portion and they're signing theirs. On the standard agreement of sale, every single page needs to be initialed. Every detail regarding your hand money. Timelines. Remember, no blank spaces, just 
because it says blank days, five if not specified, make sure you specify it. Don't leave anything up to chance. Specify it. The mortgage commitment. Any questions on that section? Anyone struggling with any of this, speak up. Act now, ask now, and we'll go over it. I think this was already pre filled in the room. Yeah, that one is. Yep. yep. That one always is. Underneath, underneath the mortgage contingency period, the seven days is already written in. That's pre filled. Yep. Inspection contingency, make sure you are marking your days. Um, as Ali said, it says 10, 12 to 15 seems to be the safe bet. You may get it quicker and that's great, but it's better to have that contingency room to breathe than have to scramble to try to get both sides to sign an addendum to extend it. Okay, so make sure you give yourself plenty of room to breathe on the inspection contingency. Anytime that we put time in the hands of another party, we wanna make sure that we're giving ourselves some room to breathe, okay? Order of the title, seven days. And Allie, are you seeing anything longer than seven days for title contingency? So the way I do it and the way I was taught to do it initially um, was I would put 17 in there and here's why, right? 10 days for your inspection, 15 days or five days for our negotiating and two days to make a decision that equals 17. So I order title immediately, but I say to title, I will let you know once we have cleared inspections. So people aren't doing uh, unnecessary work. Now they begin and they do whatever that they have to do. Things do take long in Allegheny County because we do have a little old lady down there with like actual paper books flipping through. Um, but I just put 17 in there because that gets us through our inspection contingencies. Um, but I have not had a holdup due to title now that we're out of COVID and the building is open downstairs and people can actually do title searches. So that's a great, that's a great tip um, on adding that extra time on title order and making sure that you're closing your settlement company or title search company is not doing work they don't need to necessarily do. Why that's probably a good practice to get into now is we are gonna start seeing things tighten. We're gonna see things tightening up on uh, appraisals. We're gonna hopefully see things tighten up on inspections. Um, as the prices of houses go up, those other things, inspection and, and, and appraisal are gonna start to tighten. Banks are gonna get a little bit more, um, they're gonna have a little bit more of a magnifying glass or ask if there's a little bit more of a magnifying glass on a property if it's you know astronomically priced, which we're seeing. So adding that extra time on the front end of your, of your title, not a bad tip, not a bad idea or strategy to start, to start working into, into your workflow. Order that title, give them, a heads up that that title may not need to be ordered. Won't be, wait till we get the inspection back. Don't order the title till we get the inspection back. So you'll see when I send the contract over, I have 17 days written in for title. So great tip, probably gonna be more widely uh, utilized as we go forward. So excellent tip. Thank you, Alan. All right. Any other municipal requirements, make sure that you're checking your property description and your disclosures for any of these other added elements that can pop up. If you're selling a condo or a row house that could be registered as a condo, make sure you're checking your disclosures and your property descriptions to so make sure that they're, what their zoning is and what their designation is. And then if you do not see, if there's an HOA on the property description, but you do not see HOA listed anywhere else, 
make sure you ask that question of the listing agent. What are the HOA fees? What are the HOA requirements? Do you have a copy of the HOA um, rules, regulations? Make sure I will ask that. Sorry uh, to interrupt. Okay. So we can, we can ask for that uh, handbook or whatever before we submit an offer? You should have it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're asking your client to pay for something before they know everything about it they have to be that has to be disclosed well the fees at the fees i knew mm -hmm. but they wanted to see like there's usually like some sort of handbook bylaws you know the so on and so forth. right yep so yeah. i can ask for that before an offer's made yeah okay yeah absolutely absolutely any other questions on that part Okay, let's shift to estimated closing costs. Um, if you did not get one, they are here in the office. I'll bring some back to Altoona, get some to Johnstown as well. Universal last week brought in a policy rate schedule for title insurance. That's a fixed fee. That is a fixed fee on your sheet. You have your, don't forget you have your transaction fee depending on your office. Uh, I believe here it's 200, Altoona's 199, Johnstown's 249. Um, check with your leadership to make sure you're accounting for the transaction fee here and where else? Where else can you account for the transaction fee? Where else can you make sure that you mention it? Where else can it be written? Isn't it in the uh, buyer agency contract? Yes. It better be in the buyer agency contract. <laughs> <laughs> it better be. Yep. Because if it's not, you can't charge it. I mean, you could. You can. But the reality is, you know, if they look, they get the closing table, even if you have this sheet, even if you have it on estimated closing costs, you could get away with it because they signed acknowledged it was there and it's they're paying it. They could argue the closing table if it's not their closing company's fee, it's our fee, but they didn't agree to it in their contract with you as an agent, there could be, there could be a smell created there. So avoid all issues and make sure you account for the transaction fee on your buyer agency agreement, okay? Transfer tax, transfer tax. What is transfer tax? What, how much is it? What's, what, how does it work? 1% for each side, right? 2% of the sale or 1% of each side. Occasionally, you'll see, um, and mostly it happens in trust issues, like in an in a issue where they're, they're P of a, a POA, uh, power of attorney or a trust sale. You're looking at where you have a request for the seller, from the seller for the buyer to pay the full 2%. On the other side, as the buyer, you can negotiate that into your offer where the buyer requests that the seller cover their half of the 2%, okay? Transfer tax. Home warranties, we've talked about at length here over the last few months. Um, we can cover them again. We, we can go back and, and go over what presentations that Fauna has done for us. She's done, I think, three since January. Um, but we, we, we can go over home warranties in more detail uh, at a later time. Just make sure that whatever home warranty, if you select one, that that cost, if your buyer is paying for it, that your cost is covered in the uh, estimated closing costs. Okay? Anything else? Any other questions? monies. So this, so Stacey's asking on, on the uh, buyer's estimated closing cost sheet, summary of total monies needed, purchase price, estimated costs from the column on the left, less the mortgage amount, less the seller assist or credits, less the deposit amount to get your balance due at settlement. 
How many of those can you answer at the beginning of the process before they before we have an offer accepted? How many of the how many how much of this can we get filled out? Anyone? Is anybody filling this out completely? Anyone? I, I get one done before I submit the offer if it gets accepted with what our terms are so we can see. Okay. But you don't necessarily have the lender's information, right? We don't have the mortgage, the exact mortgage information to be able to quote, nor should we, right? Well, I get mine from my lender. And how do you do that? Um, there's a guy in our office. His name is Todd. He's kind of cool. Um, and when you email him, hey, I'm working with so-and-so. Hopefully you've already got a pre-approval from him. And you say, uh, we're looking for an estimated cost sheet. Here is the address. Here is our offer price. Here is our hand money amount. Here is my admin fee. This is the title company I will be using because he knows what a lot of their typical fees are. Um, we are going to ask for seller assist, what percentage if applicable. And here are the taxes taken from real list. Can you please provide me an estimated cost sheet? Our estimated close date will be whatever. And he generates all of that for me. And why does yeah. he generate uh, for me as well? So why does he generate that for you? Good faith. We're going to do business through him. Because you asked him. He gets paid when we close a deal. So he wants to make sure, you know, that this is realistic for your client. He doesn't want to go through all of the underwriting and all of the work. Also to find out the day before closing, like I can't afford that payment. Is he the only one that'll do that? No. All you have to do is make the phone call and ask. All you have to do is make that phone call and ask. If you get one that's not playing ball, that wants to drag their feet or gives you a hard time about it, are, are you going to go back to them again? Probably not. Yeah. So chances are, if you get a good one, they're going, to, they're going to play ball with you. They're going to get you the information you're asking for to the best of their ability. They should have it, right? So when you close or prior to you executing a, a contract, uh, you should have a good net sheet, a solid idea. Prior to close, you will get a disclosing a disclosing statement from the, the settlement company, whether it be Alta, CD, or HUD, or all the above, you'll get one at clear to close for, from which you can go over with your client. Why do we want to go over that with our client before closing? Why we do we want to to have them prepared. We don't yeah. want to hold anything up. Yeah. Yeah, no blindsiding. They're not going to be blindsided at the closing table by anything that they don't recognize or they're not comfortable with. So make yourself comfortable with it. If you've closed a deal already, do yourself a favor. Go back and pull the CD from that deal and get used to it. Understand it, where things are, how to find the, the information and what it means. If you don't know, get a highlighter and highlight it and let's talk about it. Let's talk about the CD. Let's talk about what it means for your client, what it means to you and what it would mean for your client. So if you have a CD, you've closed the deal, you have access to a CD, get one out, go over it, highlight the items on there in question, and let's go over it. Let's talk about it. Okay? Any questions? Do. So I hear you talking about the the co estimated cost sheet mm -hmm. and that this person, Todd, is um, the helper in our office. Doesn't this cost sheet typically come from the the lending institution with who the, okay. Yeah, that's what Todd is. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Talk, talk, yeah. Talk, Maybe talk, I misunderstood talk. what was going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Thank you for thank you for asking. I'll clarify because not not we do have folks that have not been in our office or are new to us um, here that may not know that. And and Todd is a broker in office, um, and he does he does really well. Really great at answering questions. Is available and accessible. Um, but regardless of who you use or who your client is using for for their loan, that loan originator. Um, should be able to answer those questions for you, okay? Or loan processors. Some companies are bigger. They'll have a loan originator. Then they'll have a loan processor that basically is a liaise between the originator and the underwriting team and so on and so forth. But that very bottom bullet point on this last page before we break for the day, communicate. We have a lot of moving pieces a lot of moving parts, a lot of people with their hands in, in the pie. We need to make sure we create a communication stream with all of these parties. We have the tools to do that. You can go in and create, in command, you can create an opportunity, put your documents in, as we started about, as we started off talking about, create a timeline or a checklist in command and get yourself in the good habit of checking command on the regular, make it a daily thing. Or the old fashioned way, the old fashioned way, you have your phone, put it in your calendar. Make sure you're marking your dates, your phone calendar. It's good practice to have it, have your dates marked in multiple places so that you know you can keep that line of communication open. You know your dates and you won't miss them. You reach out to your lenders. Don't let your lenders off the hook on, on you know, too much time without hearing anything. Some agents do a follow-up Monday. Every Monday, they'll reach out to their lenders. They'll reach out to the, uh, the, the opposite size agent just to keep the lines of communication fresh. The deals are, will go a lot smoother or the end result will be easier to attain if we're keeping those lines of communication fresh and open, okay? Communication is the absolute key. You're making sure you're hitting your dates, you know in your documents, you're reviewing them, staying on top of, of your dates within those documents and getting up updates from each member of this team at least on the weekly, at least once a week, so that you know what your client knows, you know, what your client should know, what's going on in the deal. Because remember, your client, you might have four, if you have four or five deals going on or it's your only one, you might have other stuff going on. You might have created a good working schedule for yourself. Your world is continuing to turn. Their world has completely stopped with every single date that we have to hit on our, our transaction calendar. Their world has stopped. They are waiting by the phone for you to call with an update or text with an update. So don't take for granted that your client knows what's going on or that they're communicating with their lender because they're probably not. And if they are, I have the opposite problem. You have the opposite like, problem. Like I have, I probably seem like the most bugging person to this lender and the other agent because the lender is talking to him and communicating just fine with him. But I have emailed, called, and texted her multiple, multiple times. And to the point where last night I said, Hey, can you please reach out to so and so and let her know, like, I just want an update. I just haven't spoke with her or made contact in a long time and I'm not getting any response back. And he's sending me screenshots. He's like, oh, I talked to her yesterday. I talked to her today, but yet she's not responding to me at all. And he's yeah, like, just give her the time she takes. I'm like, that's not a good thing. Stay on her. 
So sometimes, Lorna, what I will do also is I will send an email. Well, one, if she's not answering, I will start CCing my client in every email I send that lender. So my client knows, like, I am attempting to follow up and keep make sure that this train is on the track and right. just kind of dropping the ball. But um, I will also, you know, do an email sometimes and just say, hey, client, will you give authorization to so-and-so to speak to me regarding this transaction. You know, sometimes, I don't know, they get weird or whatever, um, but just, I would just start CCing your client and all of those emails um, because then she's going to see, or that lender is going to see like the client is now seeing that you're attempting to keep things moving and she's just completely ignoring you and she's going to feel more pressure from her client. Right. Because she, she had no problem communicating with me at the beginning like you know when we're trained back and forth you know that was all great but the moment she had everything that she needed from me communication stopped so yeah and it could be that there's just nothing new to share I mean your big things just you know you want to make sure full mortgage application was made in those seven days you want to just make sure hey you know was appraisal ordered you know would you do me a favor That's and let me try appraisal is crazy yeah you know and then you know like Doug was saying just a weekly email to all parties and just hey you know this is our weekly status update here's what I have does anyone have any new info to add yep okay and remember like you're if you're block scheduling or scheduling and we'll go over more of this um in the coming uh in the coming week um Make this part of your game plan. Make this part of your strategy that you're going to make weekly calls to get updates on active transactions. Either side, either side, not just buyers. We we well, we want to make sure we're keeping up with our buyer agents. If you're a listing hunt, if you have a listing uh, a listing transaction, okay. Any questions? Anything to add? Any, anything to add? Um, Allie, anything you want to add? I can't see you. No? Is that a no? That's a no. Okay. All right. So just some, a, a, a skim over the basics that we've gone over before. We'll dive deeper in a one-on-one. -on -one. So if you felt, if you feel like the last 40 minutes is a little bit, you're, you're a little bit lost or maybe you heard something for the first time and you need some clarification, whatever the case is, make sure you reach out to one of us and let's get some one-on-one -on -one time set aside. Let's make sure that you're getting what you need. Um, not just questions, but tools. If you don't understand how the tools work, if you don't, have, don't know why the systems are set up a certain way, let's have these conversations. Let's not, let's not let stuff off to the side. So make sure you're reaching out to us and, uh, and, and let's get this stuff, um, let's get these questions answered. Let's make sure you have what you need, okay? Um, would you... I be able to, Go ahead. would I be able to see the slides for the consultation under contract and closed? I just didn't get the full notes and write it all down. Yep. What documents you need in, under yep. each one? Yeah, Andy's, uh, Andrew's, new to, Andrew's new to us and is so new, he doesn't even have, did you get your pause license yet? Not yet. No. So new, so right, right off the boat. So awesome stuff. But we will go over this particular slideshow. We're going to also build a folder um, for you, a consultation folder, and we're going to build a mock uh, transaction folder for you. So we're going to kind of go old school and teach you the, the bones of it so that you understand it. So you're not just, dry, you know, you know you're dragging and dropping. When you drag and drop in command, and you're moving files around digitally. We want you to know what it is you're dragging and dropping. So right. we will go over that stuff care. for sure. Is that just for Andrew or can I no. get one of those? Absolutely. Listen, <laughs> yeah, we can, yeah, we can definitely do that. <clears throat> What's that? Oh, I didn't say anything else. We can, we can, I didn't care. Do that. Let's, if you guys want to do that next week. I'm totally down for that. Although I've had a crash course over the last couple of days in command and I was told I did really good. There's still things that like that folder that you said, that mock folder, I, I learned by looking by, you know, 
theory and practice. So I, I want to be able to see it and compare. So that will really help yeah. me out. Yeah, let's do that. Well, let's build a straight from the bones up, uh, a folder, hard file, what it will look like if this was pre-command. So are you are you ready to rock and roll? I'm ready whenever you're ready. I'm just waiting for you to wrap up. We'll just leave this link on and leave it hot. You yes, I was about to say okay. that because last time I got kicked out and could not get back in. Yeah, we'll leave this one on.